Thanks, Jay, and hello, everyone. Um, it is a, uh, a pleasure to be able to, to be with you here today to discuss this really interesting project that we're getting to work on uh, here at Greenman Peterson uh, regarding the Bayah Honda Bridge down in the Florida Keys. Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to come alongside the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for the restoration of this historic structure. And, uh, and we've got put together a, a great team to, to work on it. Uh, the webinar is going to be divided up into three different parts. Um, and the first part, I'm just going to give you a, a brief history of the structure to give you an idea of uh, its historic uh, importance, uh, its significance, and, uh, and then to also give you an idea of, uh, first of all, why it even exists, but then also why it uh, exists in the state in which it currently is today. Then we'll move on to some of the preliminary investigations that were done for the structure in the field, uh, the results of our preliminary analysis, and, and how we came to our preferred alternate that we ended up pursuing as far as uh, the design. We're currently in the midst of the design for this structure, and, um, and as moving from the preliminary stages into um, into the final uh, design stage, we, we actually shifted our analysis from a different software package uh, to MIDAS. So the, the last part of this presentation will be touching on a few of the features and abilities in MIDAS that we felt um, were worthwhile uh, for the sake of, um, of switching over for this, the, the final portion of the, uh, of the project. Uh, Henry Flagler was a, a northern industrialist. Uh, in 1870, he co-founded Standard Oil with John Rockefeller and Samuel Andrews. Uh, by the end of that decade, Standard was refining about 90% of the oil in the United States, and they eventually gained nearly complete control of the oil refining and marketing industry in this country. Uh, to give you some idea of the uh, enormity of st the Standard Oil Trust, when it was uh, broken up in, in 1911 as a result of the Sherman Antitrust Act, it was divided into 34 separate companies. And in amongst those 34 companies were the companies that would become Amico, Chevron, Exxon, and Mobil. In the late 1870s, uh, Flagler started traveling to Florida in the winter for the sake of his first wife's health. And he ended up falling in love with not just the state, but the development opportunities that the state presented. Um, by 1885, he had stepped down from his day-to-day -day responsibilities at Standard Oil. And, and he started up in the St. Augustine area, purchasing short-line railroads and improving their um, traffic capacity and improving them to withstand, uh, be able to um, use higher loads. And, uh, and then also extending them down towards the south, uh, building new lines. And then in addition, all along the route, he built lavish hotels uh, in Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Ormond Beach, Palm Beach, and Miami. By 1896, his railroad had reached the southern end of the peninsula, uh, but he wasn't quite done yet because by 1904, he had decided to set off on a new plan, he, uh, which was widely considered to be impossible at the time. He wanted to extend his railway 128 miles beyond the southern tip of the peninsula to Key West. Now, Key West at the time, at 20,000 people, was the most populated city in the entire state. And it also possessed the closest deep water port to what was then the proposed Panama Canal. In addition, the railway was going to provide uh, in increased opportunities for uh, trade with Cuba and with the rest of Latin America. Uh, Flagler self-funded the, the um, venture, uh, which I've seen estimates for it ranging between 20 and $50 million, uh, which brought into current uh, currency that ranges somewhere between $500 million uh, to a $1 billion dollars uh, for the uh, total cost of the, of the project. His construction engineer, William Crone, uh, surveyed several routes, quickly landing on the decision to follow the islands around 
rather than attempting to cross uh, longer stretches with open water. The project has uh, 17 miles of bridges and 20 miles of fill embankment. Um, but of all that, there were three locations that posed the, the greatest obstacles. Uh, first, there was a two mile long crossing from uh, Long Key to Cock Key. There was a seven mile long crossing from Knights Key to Little Duck Key. And then uh, um, what was the deepest crossing on the entire project, the 24 foot deep mile wide crossing at Bahia Honda, which uh, from the Spanish of Bahia Honda means deep bay. Uh, with these particular site conditions, uh, Bahia Honda is the only location along the route that utilizes through truss structure um, and, and at over 5,000 feet long. It has an almost 250 foot uh, long Parker truss span, which is surrounded by 26 Pratt truss spans. And on the western approach, there are uh, nine plate girder uh, uh, spans. The, uh, well, the shorter spans use riveted connections. Uh, the longer Pratt and, and Parker spans use pin connections, which made it the longest pin connected uh, truss bridge in the country. Despite three hurricanes and uh, hundreds of lost lives, the project, uh, which at times employed nearly 4,000 simultaneous workers, was completed in 1912 and uh, uh, just 16 months before flag wage passing. At the time, the railway was being hailed as the eighth wonder of the world, which was a, a nice step up from when it was being called flag wage falling at the beginning. The railway functioned until the Category 5 Labor Day hurricane of 1935. The Florida East Coast Railway, which was bankrupt at the time, was not able to uh, fund the repair to the extent of damage, and as a result, sold the remaining rail infrastructure to the state of Florida. The state had already begun construction on their overseas railway, and they ended up shifting the alignment in order to be able to reuse the uh, remaining rail infrastructure that was still in acceptable condition. In the, um, at Bay of Honda, due to insufficient clearance between the trusses, they ended up building the deck for the two-lane highway along the tops of the trusses and constructed uh, approaches uh, supported on pile vents to elevate the traffic. The approaches consisted of two span steel stringers, each placed directly over corresponding age piles. The, uh, the highway ended up opening on March 29, 1938 as the southernmost segment of U.S. Highway 1. With the widening of the overseas highway to a four-lane divided highway in the 1970s, uh, traffic was closed off from the Bay Honda Bridge and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Since then, um, traffic or, uh, Access to the structure has been limited by the removal of a span from each end of the bridge. However, on the east end, it was the third from last span that was taken out, uh, leaving the approach spans and the first two truss spans available as a pedestrian overlook. Um, the overlook, the truss span specifically as overlook, were closed off to pedestrians in 2015 due to uh, extensive deterioration of the structure and, and safety concerns for the public. And, uh, and so we've been fortunate enough to be selected to uh, assist the Florida Department of Environmental Protection with the restoration of this structure. And uh, we were able to bring along um, facility inspection and transportation engineering and underwater engineering services uh, as part of our team. and they, they did a fantastic job with uh, the field in investigations and um, in, in giving us a better picture of the, the level of deterioration that exists uh, with the existing structure. Uh, FIT went out to the site on June 2016 
Uh, obviously, the picture on the right is, is a different job. Uh, there's um, a spiking bridge hit, but on the left, you can see Sonia Johnson climbing the uh, structure. She performed the inspection of the steel portion of the structure and the uh, concrete deck. And uh, since she climbed the entire structure, she was able to get hands-on inspection with every component. <coughs> And, and then I'm pretty sure it probably took multiple photos of every component because in addition to the report of findings that she sent us, she provided us with a CD of over 1,100 photos, which um, really was vital in our getting a, a good understanding of the deterioration um, member by member and, uh, and helped us with, with developing our plan for modeling and uh, for coming up with our uh, recommendations. Here you see uh, a sampling of the photos that she sent us. Um, on the left side, you see a couple photos from the approaches. Uh, top left is one of the H piles at a vent um, down where it meets the concrete jacket that goes into the ground. Uh, you can see that the section's almost entirely gone. Below the hat, you see one of the stringers at, uh, at its support. And in addition to being able to see straight through the stringer, you can see that the clip that's supposed to uh, restrain the stringer but allow for uh, thermal movement has been completely seized up due to rust. Um, and then on the right, you see a couple of photos from the uh, truss fans, uh, both top cord and bottom cord, where you see the extensive corrosion and, um, and the massive section loss, uh, loss that exists out there. In 2016, UESI went out to the site and um, performed the inspection of the piers and the abutment, um, both above and underwater. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised to find that the, uh, these portions of the structure were actually in much, much better condition than the steel. Um, we were especially pleased considering uh, these things are over 100 years old. Um, they did find uh, cracking, as, as would be expected, cracking wide enough for chloride infiltration. But there weren't any locations where they detected any uh, corrosion bleed out coming from these cracks. Pretty much all the locations where there was corrosion uh, was limited to um, support rods, um, well, rods that were protruding from the structure uh, that were, were pretty sure were uh, there to support the formwork during construction. On the underside, there are, uh, well, and there were, were also some locations of isolated, um, isolated port consolidation. Uh, but again, not too surprising considering when and how the structure was built. And, um, you know, in general, it, there, it's in very good shape. Um, on the underside, there, there are some areas of undermining due to scour. Um, you can see a picture of that over on the right. And, um, in general, it wasn't too bad. Um, there probably is some minor amount of uh, loss of capacity, but considering that the structure was designed for heavy rail and um, it's currently functioning as, as a pedestrian uh, overlook, um, whatever minor uh, capacity loss there might be there uh, isn't going to really affect the safety of the structure for its current use. Uh, pretty much everything that was found in these areas just amounted to uh, necessitating continued monitoring during the regular inspections and um, maybe some minor maintenance work. Uh, but in general, this, this stuff was all really good. So based on the information we got from the field, we, uh, we created our preliminary model. Um, going through all the photos and the report from, uh, from FIT, we were able to develop some criteria based on the amount of section loss um, that, that was exhibited on average uh, based on a member by member basis. We applied that to our model to see where we ended up and, um, and it turned out the structure wasn't safe for even the, the pedestrian loading and would require some strengthening. So we also looked at uh, what it would take to get the members that, um, that needed to be strengthened uh, up to a section uh, that would actually be, uh, be safe for the public. As part of our report that we developed, the, delivered to the DEP, we looked at multiple alternatives. Uh, obviously, no-build um, 
So that wasn't really an option. It's uh, just the safety concerns uh, of the bridge starting to fall apart. <clears throat> we looked at uh, free fuel rehabilitation, uh, disassembly, and then shipping the structure off for shop rehabilitation. Um, and then we also looked at the potential of um, doing a, a replacement, essentially a replica structure. And, uh, and then in addition to those four options, we looked at the combinations of each of the four uh, to see what made the most sense. Um, having presented our, uh, our report to the DEP and then in discussions with them, uh, we ended up deciding to move forward with a, a replica structure. Um, essentially, we're uh, planning on reusing the existing piers and abutments, and then um, we're going to replace the portions of the structure with a uh, with a structure to look essentially identical to what's out there, but utilizing modern sections uh, to replace all the existing built block sections uh, in order to facilitate you know, greater efficiency in fabrication and construction, but then also to provide the DP with a structure that's going to be um, easily maintainable for the foreseeable future. Um, and you see at the bottom there a few of the typical types of sections that existed on the bridge. Um, and in general, there are plates and angles that have been all riveted together, and, and you know, we're, we're going to be replacing these with H piles and, and, and channels and um, and plate girders. So as I mentioned uh, before, we're, we're in the midst of design here, and the preliminary portion of the design has been done in a different software package. Um, and the, looking at some of the features that were available in MIDAS, we decided that um, that we would shift over to MIDAS for uh, this next uh, stage in design. We felt like some of the features that it made available to us would, uh, would help in our analysis and, and also provide greater uh, efficiency in that analysis. Um, so for the record, I'm just going to touch on a few of the features that we found particularly helpful. Um, that uh, that helped us in, in, in that decision-making process of, of shifting over. Uh, specifically, I'm going to touch on the, the import functionality um, and uh, a few of the a few of the aspects of the import functionality that, that give you a little bit of a leg up once you um, have the model in it and and can get started with uh, assigning your members. Um, we're also going to look quickly at construction staging. Uh, I feel like the program provides a pretty straightforward setup for construction staging uh, that, that works uh, pretty well. And uh, moving on to some of the reporting for the steel design checks um, that are pretty detailed and uh, provide a manner of, of efficiently getting to the information you, you want to get to. And, uh, and then we'll wrap it up with um, how you can deal with some custom sections inside MIDAS which on a structure like this, you've, you've got a lot of sections that aren't going to be readily available in a, a drop-down menu. You're going to have to come up with um, maybe a few build-up uh, components. And, um, and then there's the way Midas deals with it is, is actually pretty, pretty efficient um, and helpful. So to start off, we've got our 3D model in, in AutoCAD that we developed. Um, as you can see, all of the individual components have been put onto separate layers um, so that we could, we could segment them out. And, and that actually comes in pretty handy once you go to bring the model into MIDAS. <clears throat> uh, so from, from this model, we, uh, we export the uh, DXF file and, uh, and we bring it into MIDAS. Um, let's make sure this is an inches. So pretty straightforward. Um, you created your new file. Just import the DXF. So when this window pops up, you browse to the DXF file. And uh, this is where having created all those different layers comes in handy. You can come over here and, and selectively bring in what you want, um, which is great if you've got a model that has additional information in it that you don't want to bring in. You can be pretty select 
constructed about what you actually transfer over into Midas. So having selected all of those, you can come in. These properties, you're, you can just leave them blank and, and deal with them later. Uh, but we'll just, just get them knocked out now. Obviously, you can come in and add your material properties, steel or concrete or whatever. Um, your section, same thing. Come in and, and add your different types of sections. Uh, since we've already got a file, we're just going to import everything we've already have created in the other file. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. And so now we've got everything in there. We just hit OK. And it pops your model in. Uh, so you'll notice over here the uh, materials and the sections that have been defined and assigned to something appear in black. The ones that have been defined but not assigned to anything come up in blue. So as you can see, when it pulls the model in uh, from the DXF file, it just assigns everything to your first material and your first section. Um, but one of the other things it does that um, I find incredibly helpful, all those different layers that you were able to pull in, it automatically adds those to uh, structure groups. So you can go through and uh, say there's 35 stringer elements, you can just uh, select every single one, um, keep, keep them all together. It allows you the opportunity to maybe if you want to look at them specifically. or um, and it, The grouping actually helps quite a bit um, as, as you're going through your model and, and trying to pull results and, and look at what's going on. But it also helps with just assigning properties because, like I said, everything came in as a a70950, but you can go through and just select all your bracing and right click select, come over to A36, right click assign, and now you can see that went black. All of the numbers are, are now assigned to A36, and your other numbers are all still A709. In the same fashion, you can come over and, and select your um, diagonal bracing. And say we want to make this a double angle, we just come over and assign it, and you can see it hit update. Uh, so obviously with, with this number of members, it, it would take quite a bit of time to go through one by one and, um, and assign them a, a material and a section. Um, but really with the way that Midas lays it out, I find it to be um, just about as efficient as you can get it. Uh, so from here, we're just going to switch over to a file that has a bit more defined in it. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're still working on this job, so by no means is this a final model. Um, not even our most recent model. <laughs> it's a, a good one to, to just show what um, the, these particular features. So here you see we've, we've assigned all our uh, all our member properties, all our section properties. We've uh, maybe shifted a few things around to, to get them in, in a better position than where we had it in our uh, AutoCAD model. Uh, with members like the uh, portable diagonals, and we've rotated those around to get them in a good orientation. And, uh, Okay. And um, so coming over here with the materials, you can see they've all been assigned to something except for the concrete that actually comes into play with the construction staging. We defined a dummy material which essentially consists of just concrete with no weight uh, that we've uh, assigned to uh, these dummy beams that we uh, created in order to, to distribute load. We've also got another dummy beam uh, just for the uh, bar to, to represent the barriers. Uh, so, so we've got our supports defined, our beam end releases are defined. And, and when you bring your model in, you import it. It um, pretty much every uh, node is going to have full, full moment transfer. So locations where you want a pin connection or you, you want some sort of reduced um, restraints, you're going to have to define those. And, uh, and so that's been done here, uh, and then there have been a number of rigid links created to uh, 
to transfer loads from one node to another. But our, our loads defined, and we've got uh, an H10 vehicle on there. So essentially, all our structural components and our loads have been defined in the structure. Uh, but in addition, we've created some more groups. So we've got the groups that, that were initially created uh, on the import. We also have a number of boundary groups uh, for, for the uh, rigid links, but then also for the supports and for the end releases for the, uh, for the beams. And then we've also got some uh, load groups that were created for the, um, for the load that the structure is going to experience. Now the, the way the, the construction staging functions is everything's defined based on a group that gets activated or deactivated. So if you have a load or a boundary condition that is not in a group that gets activated, it may as well not exist in the structure because it's not going to be um, it's not going to be taken into account when the analysis gets run. But um, <clears throat> here um, for the construction stage, you can just come over to that button. And when you first set it up, this is going to be blank. And um, a mock model. This is going to be uh, blank, and you would hit add, um, and which would bring up a, a window just like this. Um, like I said, I, I feel the construction staging setup in Midas is, is pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, you're going to name your stage, duration of your stage, and then in this window, you're going to get a list of the different groups that you've created. So essentially, these structures groups will show up in this window and then paying for the boundary groups and the load groups. And based on what you are looking to activate in each stage, you would move it into this window. Whatever you want to deactivate, you would move into this window. So in this first stage, we're creating the base steel portion of the structure. So we've activated everything except for those dummy beams I had discussed earlier. And we're activating all of the boundary conditions. And we're activating the self-weight of the structure. Uh, moving on to the next stage, you end up activating the wet concrete loads that we've applied, applied to the structure. And then in stage 2-2, two, two, where the concrete has hardened, we're activating the dummy beams that we've defined, and then deactivating the wet concrete load. Stage 3, you've got your barrier loads activated in addition to your dummy beam for your barrier loads. And then stage four is it's essentially just your long-term structure uh, with uh, with those loads. Uh, in addition to the to defining your construction staging, you also need to for uh, any composite sections. Uh, you can see here the stringers along the top have been defined as composite section, and so you need to come in and define your composite section for the construction stage. Again, this would be empty. You would hit add. Um, but essentially, you come into this window, uh, and you select which stage the component's going to be activated in initially. You select which component you're looking at. And then down in this window, you tell the program when to activate each portion of the composite section. So element one, we're going to be you can, you can deal with these as either the element itself or its material. So we're going to deal with it as an element, activate it in the active stage, which we call now the stage one. And then um, the, the second portion of the composite section, um, you are going to, we're, we're going to deal with it as the material. And this is where that, that gray 4500 concrete comes in. We defined it as, as being that material. And that ends up getting activated in stage 2-2. Two, two. So you would do that for each one of your different uh, composite sections that you've defined to let the program know uh, when to go ahead and activate those during construction uh, staging. So now that we've got everything defined, we can um, run our analysis. And that just takes a few seconds.
And so with that then we can move on to some of the reporting uh, for the seal design uh, component. Um, when you come over to design, this is where you can find out all your different common parameters, your unbraced length, your K factors, wondering ratios. Um, you know, and you can you can do this you can define it globally, but you can drill down and, and define each of these properties on a number by number basis. And then come in and uh, and when you still code check. <coughs> And so you can see there's a couple angle sections that have come up uh, as not being good. Uh, you can hit double arrows to expand. And I think this went, this view actually provides a, a wealth of information um, for the small amount of space that it takes up. So you can get um, essentially this is displaying when it comes up on a on a member type and element type basis, controlling member for each type of uh, of component. Uh, you can also switch it to a member view, where it is actually going to show you all of the members. Um, in general, you can you can just look at the controlling ones for each type and um, sort it by good sections, no good sections, and it's going to give you the uh, combination ratio, shear ratio, um, your your unbraced lengths, your CV values, what K values, assuming. Um, so you can look at all the base parameters and get a good idea of if it's looking at the number correctly and, and where is that number, how far over is it <coughs> just from this one screen. Um, but then you can drill down even more. Say we look at this angle, you can pull up a summary view that is really just the little combinations and then um, essentially the same information you got on that first screen, but uh, in a nice printable format. You also have this graphic view uh, that allows you to take a look at the, the actual section properties, the, the loads that it's experiencing, the forces in the number. Um, and then each one of the checks, it shows you whether it's good or no good and uh, where your ratio is sitting. So a good quick snapshot of uh, any particular number you want to look at. And, uh, and then if you want to drill down even further, for each member, you can pull up this detail for you, which allows you to look at the load combinations, section properties, uh, the loads that are being applied, and then it actually goes through all of the design checks, providing you with the reference that it's using from the particular code you have set, uh, the ratio that it's coming up with, and whether it passes or not. And you know, going through, you're looking at your axial strength, your Lectural strength on the major axis, your lateral torsional buckling. So you can get a good snapshot of, of what checks are being performed, what are the references for that check if you want to go in and dig into it a little bit deeper, um, what sections pro check section properties is it using, what loads is it using. Um, so you can get an idea of, all right, well, did I somewhere mess up with some of my fixity or um, with how I've set up my model, and, you know, do, do these properties and these loads make sense for what I'm trying to do? And um, and then if they do, you can look at the, the code references and, and figure out in more detail what's going on with, with uh, numbers that are, are failing on you. Um, but then say from, from this window, if, if you want to take a look at um, replacement sections, you can just come up to change. You can hold steady within a certain range, any property for the element that you're looking at, and, um, and then what range you want your ratio to be for, uh, for the uh, code checks, and then just have it search. And it'll pull up all of the members um, that, uh, that work for that, for that uh, section to be replaced too. So you can even change if you want to go even lower to pull up more sections. So um, really quick way to, to, to if, if you're certain that all of your design parameters are correct and your loading is correct, a very quick way to, to go in and figure out which section do I need to replace what I've got to get something that works in there. So <clears throat> let's say you want to replace it with a 6 by 6 
and you can just hit change and close. And you can see it updated the design check and it says okay now. Uh, the one thing you'll notice, this is section 10. Section 10 here is still showing five by five. So if you want to actually up, uh, update it into your model, you come over to update, you select the section you want to update, and now you can return to I oh, should have updated. I don't know why I didn't. But um, anyway, so so with these code checks, it, uh, it it's a very quick way of um, the, the way that my uh, display it is a very quick way to be able to get a good idea in general how your structure is performing, but then it's very quick to drill down, find specific members that aren't working, um, see what code checks aren't working to, to figure out if um, maybe there's something you need to tweak in your analysis, and then if not, find a section to replace it with. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the, the last item, which on a structure like this, there, there are a lot of sections that um, are not, not going to be um, easily found. <coughs> Um, either angles and strange, uh, strange orientation, or you know maybe channels that are um, put together with a plate on top or something like that. And, and what we're going to look at specifically is the bottom cord of the structure. Uh, you can see here what we've got defined right now is an H file that's turned on its side. What's out in the field is a um, series of plates and angles that are riveted together to create pretty much the same uh, shape, except that there's a gap that runs straight down the center uh, between the two uh, portions. So, you know, we could deal with it with a standard H file just by cutting holes in the web all the way down. Uh, but what we're going to look at here is what if we take a couple WTs and turn them on their sides? And, uh, and, and that way actually get even closer to, to uh, the existing shape. Um, and fortunately, Midas actually makes that a pretty straightforward process. Uh, you can come over to Tools and open up the General Section Designer. Coming over to Shape, you can right click and add Basic Shape. We're going to add a T-section based on the AISC code, and we're looking at a WT 6 by 36. We'll define the material for it. Uh, and um, I'm changing this to oops, and inches. We'll change our insertion point to negative four inches with a rotation of negative 90. And here's our first part of our section. So double clicking, you can select that. And it's easy enough, easy as hitting control C, control V to co copy and paste. And we can then edit the new section that came in and change its insertion point to four. And then we'll just rotate it the other direction and hit OK. And, and now we've got essentially a section we're looking for. Um, one thing I've come across uh, as an issue is with these custom sections, and it seems Midas doesn't like when there's an open gap like that, like we have in here. The way I've gotten around that, and, and maybe when Jay comes back, he'll tell me there's a better way to do this, but this is how I've done it, um, is you can just add another basic shape. And uh, I'll add in a, a user-defined rectangle um, and, and just give it a tiny uh, thickness and a, a width to bridge that gap and bring it in. And, um, and then we can select our numbers and merge them. We can do the same with these. And now we've got a single shape that bridges across that gap, and we can bring it to Midas. This button up here allows you to create your uh, link to the open model. 
So simply clicking on that, it uh, links over to the Midas model. You can see it went from red to green to show that it's linked. And in the text box, we can type in the uh, name of the section. There's section one and hit export. You can see it was brought into Midas there. And so we can select our bottom chord and we can assign it to that new section. And since we had the H file in there, but we had it ro rotated 90 degrees, when it brings in this new section, it's now rotated 90 degrees as well. But that's easy enough to fix, uh, fix just by going to element and then change parameters. And this is the window where you change all the, the individual parameters for uh, a component. You can change the material ID or the section ID. We're going to change the element local access and, uh, axis, and uh, we're going to change it back to zero. So you just hit apply. And so you can see the section we created has been brought into Midas. Um, and um, we can rerun our analysis on it. Now, when I was running the steel design checks earlier, you may have noticed in this message window there were a number of sections that were coming through that said that they couldn't be analyzed due to uh, using the, the steel uh, code checks. And those are either going to be your, your concrete sections or um, for a lot of those, those are the built-up sections that have been created in the section modeler and brought in. Um, Minus doesn't actually check those within the program itself, but it does give you uh, the capability of bringing that back into the section module, um, the section, <laughs> tongue tied, the section designer uh, in order to check it over there. So now that your analysis is done in here, you can reselect that bottom chord, and you can see here in the selection window that, uh, that those particular elements have been selected. Going back into the section designer, you can see that those same elements have popped up in this window, and all you have to do is hit import. And it asks you which load combinations and which parts of the section you want to pull in. Uh, for this, we'll just pull everything in, hit OK. And as you can see, here's the section we initially defined, and here's the section that got pulled in from Midas with all your load combinations in there. So you can double click on that, and you can see here, when you define load combinations, it's brought all that information in from Midas. Uh, I'll go ahead and change our design code to Ashto and uh, hit the design section button. And once it's run the design, it gives you a wealth of information on the number uh, interaction diagrams, uh, axial moment uh, in both directions. You can look at it by load combination, you can look at it by angle, and obviously it pulls in all that, all the relevant information on this side. You can also look at your moment interaction uh, by load combination or by the uh, concurrent axial force. Again, all the information is over on the side here. Uh, but then I, I really enjoy this view. It gives you a 3D view of the interaction uh, where you can the the uh, the axial moment interaction, the moment moment interaction, and uh, it provides you all of your ratios off to the side for your very slow cases. And um, as you can see, because it's the lower uh, bottom chord, you've got pretty much just axial loads in there. Uh, but you can actually show every single load combination. You get a few where there's a little bit of moment in there, um, uh, but those obviously are not the controlling the results are working there. Uh, but uh, really a, a useful tool um, and Midas provides a great means of being able to take these custom sections that can be relatively complicated, uh, complex, you can, um, you can put them together pretty quickly, get them into Midas, get them analyzed, pull them out, and then run your design checks. And uh, you can see we did all that in about, I don't know, five minutes. Uh, so, and just one, one more thing I was going to mention real quick. Uh, another thing I, I, I like about Midas is, is just the fact that 
pretty much everything in MIST. You can pull up a table view for it. Uh, I, I find this incredibly helpful, not just because if you want to change a property in a member, you can just select the cell and copy and paste it across 20 others and, and it updates like that. Um, if you want to pull information out of MIDAS, you can export all these uh, all these as Excel spreadsheets and um, you know you can pull all your results out into Excel and then develop maybe an external check if you want to corroborate what you're seeing in MIDAS and provide you a good way of getting that information out in, in a useful format. Um, and, and so with that, those, those were pretty much the main features that I was, I was just wanting to go over real quickly uh, with regards to um, our decision-making process to switch over to Midas for this final portion of the, uh, of the design. Um, thank you all for hanging in with me and um, hopefully uh, uh, you found out a little bit of something, if not about the structure, about Midas uh, that you didn't know before. And um, I guess if there's any questions, we can knock those out in the few minutes that are left. <laughs>